I want to start with uh, the terminology that I'm using, male, female, and intersex at the level of 3G sex. So 3G sex is a categorization system in which 99% of humans uh, can be classified into one of two categories, male or female. And, and this is important. Belonging to a category entails having all the characteristics of that category. So if I'm a female, then I have all of this list, or at least I was born with all of this list, with XX, ovaries, womb, etc. And if I'm a male, I'll have all of this list. This quality of 3G sex, that if you belong to a category, you have all its characteristics, is very unique. And most of the categories we typically use in daily life do not have this quality. Uh, for example, if you think of chairs, and this is just from Google, then it is not only that they don't all share, uh, all, they don't all have all the characteristics of their class, it's actually very difficult to decide which characters, characteristics they have in common. That 3G sex is such a powerful classification system relies on two qualities. The first is that uh, in, it is almost dimorphic, or there is an almost perfect dimorphism uh, into a male form and a female form at each level. And the second characteristic is that it has an almost perfect matching between the levels. In other words, if uh, I know that someone has the female form at the genetic level, this someone is very, very, very high, uh, likely to also have the female form at the gonadal and genitals levels. Only about 1% of the human populations do not fit into one of these two categories, male or female. And we typically refer to them as intersex. And, and for the purpose of our discussion, I will divide intersex into two types. The first type has the intermediate form at one or more levels of sex. So they may have over testis or an intersex genitalia. This type reflects the fact that the different levels of 3G sex are not truly dimorphic. So this will be truly dimorphic, so we'll have two distinct forms, a male form and a female form, but in reality, the different levels of 3G sex have a bimodal distribution with a very low, but not zero, area in between the two peaks. The second form of intersex has the male form at some levels and the female form at other levels. And this example, and this example is of a complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. And these subjects have the male form at the genetic and gonadal levels and the female form at the uh, genitalia level, external genitalia level. This type of intersex reflects the fact that the match between the levels of 3G sex is not always perfect. So, for example, if we look at females, females have a perfect match between their forms at the different levels of 3G sex, and similarly, males have a perfect match between the different form, uh, the, the, their form at the different levels, but complete androgen insensitivity syndrome are intersex in that they don't have a perfect match, they have a mismatch. They have some characteristics of the male form and some of the female form. I want to stress that a mismatch between levels can occur even if, ev if every level is perfectly dimorphic, as I've drawn here. And the reverse is also true. Even in a system which has perfect matching, we will still have intersex individuals if some levels are not truly dimorphic. So in this sense, we can say that matching and dimorphism are independent. However, in this case of perfect matching, but the different levels are not truly dimorphic, uh, we will still be able to align subjects on a continuum between male form and female form. So the intersex subject will have everything matching. Okay, so will be matching intersex. And of course, for a system to be truly dimorphic, it has to have both perfect matching and perfect dimorphism. And I think most of the criticism uh, of treating sex as dichotomous focuses on the fact that sex, or that the different levels of sex, are not truly dimorphic. And of course, this is a very correct criticism. 
But to this I want to add another focus. And this is that the match between the different levels of sex uh, is not perfect. And this will be the main focus of, of my lecture. So let's go, go back to 3G sex as a model. And this system, 3G sex, is highly dimorphic and highly matching. It's not perfect, but it's highly dimorphic and highly matching. So that 99% of humans are indeed 3G males or 3G females, which means, and again, this is the important part, that they have all the characteristics of their category. And what I want to claim is that using this model of this view of 3G sex as a model to understand sex differences in other domains, such as brain and behavior, cognition, or what I will term gender, leads to the erroneous assumption that sex differences in these other domains obey the same rules. That is, that sex differences there are highly demorphic and highly matching. And that therefore, humans can be divided into men and women, and brains can be divided into male brains and female brains. However, these assumptions of dimorphism and matching do not hold true for sex differences in any other domain. Well, indeed, they don't even hold true for the levels of street G sex, but there it's almost true. But in any level beyond 3G sex, and I'll show you this, uh, it is almost true that they are never true. So it's never, you never see dimorphism and you never see matching. These assumptions do not hold true even for sex differences, even for sex differences beyond, uh, beyond 3G sex, even sex differences in bodily characteristics. From the level of sex hormones, such as estradiol and uh, testosterone, which we see here, to the level of observable body characteristics, which show a sex difference such as height, which we see here, there is considerable overlap between the distributions of males and females, and the match between the different forms is far from being perfect. This is also true even at uh, the level of secondary sex characteristics. For example, more than a third I repeat, more than a third of males have the female form of breasts together with a male form of facial and body hair, so we can see here. And similarly, many women have the male form of facial and body hair together with the female form of breasts and body. So we see that even if we look at the body, there are many people with an intersex body because of having either um, an intermediate form at one of more levels of body or for having the male form at some characteristics or the female form at other characteristics. Because, because of this and because many of these features such as sex hormones and the secondary sex characteristics are typically grouped under the general term sex, I use the term 3G sex to refer only to this part of sex which is almost truly demorphic and tr truly uh, matching, almost. So let's move to the brain. There are many sex differences in brain structure. There are differences in the size of the brain, there are differences in the size of specific brain regions, there are many differences in the microanatomy of the brain, I'll show you a few shortly. There are differences in several neurotransmitter systems. Most people take these differences as evidence for the existence of a male brain and a female brain because they implicitly assume that these differences add up one to the other to create a male brain and a female brain. At first, this sounds very logical. There are many differences between the brains of males and females, so there must be a male brain and a female brain. But we can now say that sex differences in brain structure will add up to create a male brain and a female brain only if there is a high degree of matching between the different levels. If there is not a high degree of matching, we'll have many intersex brains. And of course, the number of intersex brains will further increase if there is not a high degree of dimorphism in the different levels. So, what I will do now is ask the two questions. Are sex differences in brain structure dimorphic and are they matching?
and we will start with dimorphism, which I think you are more familiar with. So, as I said before, when we say dimorphism, we mean two distinct forms. And I think a good example may be uh, the rudent uh, SDN, a uh, sexually dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area, which you see a picture of here. And the size of this nucleus is about five to seven times larger in males compared to females. However, this is a very rare example. And as, as many people here also noted, uh, most sex differences in the brain are not dimorphic. In fact, I think that in the human brain, uh, there is to date no region for which a perfect dimorphism has been demonstrated. And here we can see a, a nucleus that is supposed to be the human analog of the rudin SDN. And you can see that although there is a, a big sex difference in humans, so it's about, an average, about twice as large in males compared to females, you can see, of course, that there is a great degree of overlap between the two sexes. Sex differences in the brain are mostly not dimorphic. This means that there are many people with an intersex brain because they have one or more features of the brain uh, whose form is intermediate between a male form and a female form. However, as I pointed out earlier, if in the brain we have perfect matching between the different levels, we will still be able to align brains on a continuum between a female brain and a male brain. So the, now we turn to the question, are these differences matching? Okay, and, and just avoid using the term sexual dimorphism in a, whatever you can do, because there are so many examples of this, and keep this term only to the rare, very rare occasion in which there is a true uh, sexual dimorphism. Okay, so now to matching. I think no one explicitly uh, tested or asked the question, is uh, the matching in the brain? But the most dominant theory of sex and brain to date uh, implicitly assumes matching. And this is a theory which I know is very, we are all very fond of. Uh, and this is the organizational hypothesis which dates back to 1959 and unfortunately still dominates our field. According to this hypothesis, testosterone masculinized or defeminized, I'm not going to this, but testosterone masculinized, uh, masculinizes the brain just as it masculinizes the external genitalia. Now, if indeed testosterone was the only factor that was responsible for sexual differentiation, and if it was acting through a single mechanism, then there was a good reason to expect a high degree of matching between the different uh, levels of sex in the brain. Under high testosterone levels, all the brain will have the male form. Under low testosterone levels, all the brain will have the female form. And under intermediate testosterone levels, all the brain will have an intermediate form or an intersex form. And again, we will be able to align brains on a continuum between a male brain and a female brain, according to the degree of exposure to testosterone. However, none of these assumptions is correct. So we know that testosterone has a role in the sexual differentiation of the brain. However, it is by no means the only factor. And in recent years, there has been a lot of work on the, on the role of estradiol in, uh, um, in the sexual differentiation of the brain. Moreover, we now know that these two hormones act via many different ways and mechanisms to affect brain stru structure. And I'm not going to go into these two uh, further, but if you are interested in this, so the work of Margaret McCarthy, whatever you think of her, but her work is really informative in these two issues. So if the assumptions that testosterone is the sole factor and that it acts via a single mechanism are not correct, then there is no reason to expect a high degree of matching between the different levels of uh, sex in the brain or between the different uh, brain features. And indeed, there are many studies demonstrated that, demonstrating that environmental events can change the sex of only some brain features. So even if we assume that there was a perfect matching before the event, let's say that the whole brain was female, then following the event, some features of the brain will change the sex, some will not, and we will have an intersex brain. So matching will be disturbed. And what I want to do now is show you several studies which demonstrate this principle 
And with every, uh, with every study, I will present more principles. And at the end, I will put all the principles together and we will get to the conclusion that all brains are intersex and that they cannot be aligned on a continuum between a male brain and a female brain. The first study I want to show you tested the effects of stress on the hippocampus and uh, specifically they tested the density of dendritic spines. I don't know if you can see them, but this is the small red dots along, uh, th these are the spines along the dendrites. And here we can see a piece of dendrite from a male rat, this is all in rats, a male rat and a female rat. And I want to thank uh, Tracy Shores for sending me these uh, pictures. And I added red arrows so it is easier to detect the spines. And I guess for most of you, this is the first time you actually get to see a sex difference in the brain. So here it is. <laughs> and you can clearly see that the dendrite from the male has less, than, uh, less spines compared to the dendrite from the female. So we can say that dendrites in this region have a male form, which is sparse spines, and a female form, which is dense spines. There was another group of rats in this study, and these rats were stressed for 15 minutes. That's it, 15 minutes before their brains were examined. And again, we see a dendrite from a male and a dendrite from a female. And strangely enough, the dendrite from the male has what we have just termed the female form, that is, lots of spines. And the dendrite from the female has what we have just termed the male form, which is few spines. So we see here what we will see in additional studies. The form of dendrites in this region depends on sex. This is very important, especially in this room. The form of dendrites in this, in this region depends on sex. It is different in males and in females. But it does not depend only on sex. Knowing that the dendrite I'm looking at is from a female is not enough to predict whether this female will have lots of dendrites or few dendrites. To predict this, I also need to know whether this female has been under stress recently or not. <coughs> so we see that although sex is important, it is the interaction between sex and stress, and more generally we'll see the environment. So it is the interaction between sex and stress that determines the form of um, neurons in, or the form of dendrites in this region. So this is the first uh, principle. Up until now, we were looking at apical dendrites of these neurons. And here we can see it in average form. So you can see that without stress, the density of dendrite uh, spines was higher in uh, females, and following stress, it was higher in males. Now, Shores and colleagues also looked at basal uh, dendrites of the same neurons. And here what we can see is that there was no sex difference without stress, but a, stre a sex difference appeared following stress. So we can see another general principle here. The same manipulation has different effects on different brain features. 15 minutes of stress reversed a sex difference in, the, in this brain feature and caused the emergence of a sex difference in the other feature. So this is causing a mismatch in the sex of, uh, of the brain and intersex um, uh, brain. But what is particularly amazing about this study is that, is that this is all happening in the same neurons, in different new dendrites of the same neurons. So how can we talk of a male brain and a female brain if even single neurons can be intersex? The next study demonstrates the same principle, that the same manipulation has different effects on different brain features, this time following chronic stress, again in the hippocampus, but this time looking at the density of cannabinoid receptors. And here we can see a sex difference uh, before stress, so these are non-stressed males, non-stressed females, and you can see that in males the density of the receptors is higher, but following stress the sex difference is reversed, as we have just seen, and uh, males have the female forms and females have the male form. In another region uh, of the hippocampus, the dorsal hippocampus, we see that there was a sex difference before stress, but following stress, the de sex difference disappeared. So the same principle, one manipulation, different effects of different uh, brain regions. 
Another general point I want to make or to demonstrate using, the, using this study is that it is meaningless to talk of a male form and a female form of brain features because simple manipulations can reverse or change what is male and what is female. Moreover, the two studies we have just looked at demonstrate that it is actually impossible to decide which is the true male form and which is the true female form. Are uh, males under stress more true males than males without stress? Are females under stress more true females than females without stress? If we say, for example, that the non-stress non, no state is the true sex, okay, then this can work in this study. So we can say that this is a true male form, this is a true female form, so following the manipulation, males had the female form, females had the male form. It will also work here. Here, following the manipulations, the males will have the female form, and the females will stay with the female form. But the same principle will not work if we add the first study we, we, we just saw. Because if before stress, this was a male form and this was a female form, then how should we call the form of the brain in males after the manipulation, after stress? So we are left without names now. So, of course, <coughs> we can say uh, that the true male form is the state in which uh, the male differs from a true female. And this will go nicely with some uh, psychological theories on uh, the development of manhood, right? That it's, it's different from the female, that it's Chodorov. But of course we will be left with the question, so what is the true female? Is she uh, always under stress, sometimes under stress? Uh, we now know that there are changes, at least in rats probably, also in humans, during the estro cycle. So when during the cycle are we true females and when are we false? And what happens if we take pills? Okay. Now this problem of what is the true male form and what is the true female form is intensified by the fact that changes in brain structure occur, uh, occur also during normal development and aging. And for example, uh, this is the same nucleus we have just looked at in humans again, and you can see that after the age of 45, we no, no longer see a, a sex difference in this region, the human analog of the SDN. So is a true male and a true female, an old one, a young one, okay, which is the true male and the true female? So, so clearly the attempt to distinguish a male from, from a female form is futile at best. It is more rational and sensible to use informative terms such as high versus low, dense versus sparse, long versus short. But I am using this male-female terminology here and I will continue to do this now because this will help me make the point that brains do not have sex or if you have to speak of the sex of the brain, then brains are intersex. Oh, this is another example. Okay, the next study is quite unique because it tested the effects of both acute and chronic stress. And what's unique about it, it was tested in both males and females. And this allows me to demonstrate another principle, which is that different manipulations have different effects on the same brain feature. So this figure presents the level of BDNF in the uh, prefrontal cortex. And we can see that in males, both this is control, both acute stress and chronic stress were without an effect. But in females, chronic stress, but not acute stress, reduced the level of BDNF in this region. And here we look at the BDNF in the dendrite gyrus, and again, uh, oops, and again, there was no effect in males, but in females this time it is acute stress that is causing a change and not chronic stress. So the general principle again is different manipulations exert different effects on the same brain feature. It is not that, for example, uh, the more stress one experiences, the more masculinized her brain becomes. No, different manipulations take the brain in different directions, which implies that we will not be able to align brains on a male-female continuum. Another general principle I want to uh, demonstrate using this figure is that there may be more than one, uh, there, may, there may be more than two forms to a brain feature. 
It seems that when we hear that the brain feature is affected by stress, by sex, excuse me, we automatically think that this brain feature has two forms, a male form and a female form. But of course it may have many forms. And for example, in this, uh, in this figure we may think of three forms. A form in males and form in non-stressed females and the form in stressed females. Of course this is only an illustration because judging by the size of the arrow bars, it's actually more reasonable to assume that the level of BDNF in this region is actually continuous and should, be not, should not be divided into any number of distinct forms. But the general point I'm trying to make is that the fact that a brain feature is affected by sex tells us little about the possible forms it may have. Okay, our next and the last example is a, a, a paper of uh, Janice Juraska, who I believe was the first uh, to note that the same manipulation may have opposite effects in males and in females. And what she did in this study, she compared rats that were housed individually in standard laboratory cages to rats that were housed in groups and with several objects that were changed daily. So we can call this enriched environment. And here we can see a, a figure showing dendritic, dendritic length as three different layers of the visual cortex of the rat. And what I want to focus now is not on sex differences, but on the effect of the manipulation on each layer. And specifically, was it similar in males and in females? So we can see here on the right that the manipulation had the same effect on males and in females. I added the, the circles, or the uh, ellipse in the colors. In the middle, it affected only males but not females. And in this region, it affected males more than it affected females. So the general principle here is that the interaction between manipulation and sex, the interactions are complex. For every brain feature, this is the interaction is different. In some brain regions, the manipulation will have the same effect in the two sexes. In another, it will affect one sex and not the other. In a third region, it will have opposite effects, etc., etc. There are no simple rules to describe the effect of a manipulation and its relation to sex. And if you think you have detected a rule, for example, that males are more uh, affected by this manipulation than females, then think of it again, because we see that in the hippocampus, for example, uh, we see opposite effects in males and females, and females seem to be more affected. And in another region, again, the females are more affected and the males are not affected. So let's summarize all, all the principles that they, I, we, I, I've showed you. I think the first conclusion is that the brain is a complex structure. I think it's an important conclusion. The brain is a complex structure with an incredible ability to change in an infinite number of ways and features. And this leads us immediately to the next conclusion, which is it is meaningless to talk of a male form and the female form of brain features because development and aging may change what is male and what is female because simple manipulations can change what is male and what is female, and because probably most brain regions have many more than three, two distinct forms. However, sex is an important factor in determining the structure of the brain. However, it is not the only factor. There are other factors such as age, stress, uh, housing conditions, rural conditions, or more generally the environment, these all factors have an important effect on brain structure. Now this is of course not new, this is what we were all talking about when we said brain plasticity. But the important part is that um, these different factors may affect the brain differently in males and in females. So, and so, um, so we, what we can say is that there are complex interactions between all these factors, sex, age, environment, there are complex interactions between uh, these factors and these complex interactions are determining the structure of the brain. And in complex interactions, what I mean is what we have just 
Uh, so, the term man manipulation, and we can add here aging and development, uh, can create, enhance, reverse, eliminated, eliminate or not affect a sex difference. And the same manipulation typically exerts different effects on different brain features. And as a result of this, matching is disturbed. So there is no perfect matching in the, in the brain and intersex brains are created. So if we, look, we go back to our question, are there male brains and female brains, then the answer is no, because sex differences in the brain are not matching and are mostly not dimorphic. We can say that there are no male brains and no female brains. It is meaningless to talk of the sex of the brain. Brains do not have sex. <laughs> but if you must relate to the sex of the brain, you can say that brains are intersex. Not 1% of them, all of them. But we are not done yet. The last principle was that different manipulations exert different effects. So the intersex brains cannot be aligned on a continuum between a male brain and the female brain. I want to end this part of my talk with a, with a story that Rebecca will show uh, like, and I guess you are all familiar, familiar with the story uh, about the male fetus and the huge testosterone surge that is transforming his small brain from the default female form to the male form. And I want to add to this story just one more element, stress. Now picture the fetus mother. During the long weeks of pregnancy, she sometimes experiences stress. And whenever she does, some features of her fetus brain change their sex. So when her boy is born, his brain is a mosaic of, most, of both male and female characteristics. This mosaic is uniquely his, molded by the complex interactions of his hormones and the environment he has been living in up until now. The same is true for the female fetus. Her brain is also a unique mosaic molded by the complex interactions of hormones and environment. So we see that we are already born with a brain that is neither male nor female. It is intersex, it's a mixture of male and female characteristics. And we haven't even said one word yet about estradiol and other factors. Before I move to gender, I want to say something about uh, sex differences in brain pathology. It has become very popular, and we heard about uh, Simon ba Baron Cohen. It has become very popular to explain sex differences in brain pathology as evidence for the existence of male brains and female brains. And I want to show you how this mosaic view I'm presenting can account for sex differences in brain pathology uh, as well. And I think everyone uh, today will agree that brain pathology is a result of complex interactions between environmental events and genetic susceptibility factors, which means that the same event will lead to different outcomes in different individuals based on their genetic background. And what we need to add to this is what we have just seen, that the effects of environment and of, on, of genes, I'll show you in a minute, that the effects of the environment on the brain depends on sex. All the studies we have looked at up until now only showed the interaction between environment and sex. And I found only one study with, which demonstrates the triple interaction of genes, environment and sex. And this study tested the effects of stress in a transgenic mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. And what you can see here is that these are males, all transgenic. So you can see that stress did not affect males, but stress led to an increase in amyloid beta, which is related to Alzheimer's disease, uh, in females. So it is the interaction of a genetic factor an environmental factor, stress this time, and sex, which determines brain pathology in this model. 
Another thing this study nicely demonstrates is that the existence of a sex difference in the pathology of a brain in, the, in pathology does not necessarily entail a sex difference in the normal brain. As for example, Simone Baron Cohen is suggesting when claiming that the normal male brain is a little autistic because autism is more uh, common in boys. So we can see here that there is no basis to claim that the uh, non-stressed female is a little Alzheimer's-like because following stress she is more likely to develop Alzheimer. And I want to show you another example, uh, this time from a study that uh, Roni Yankelevich uh, have uh, presented in the poster sessions, and you can still see it. And this time uh, we tested the effects of exposure to, to fluoxetine or Prozac uh, on rat development and on behavioral pathology, if you want. So uh, we injected rats just after they were born and then tested the behavior at a few time points and I will show just the behavior at adulthood. And what you can see here, and I will not go into the details, but it, what you can immediately see is that, it, is that this looks exactly as the figures we saw before on the effects of environment on brain structure. So for every behavior, the effect of the manipulation, this time exposure to Prozac, was different depending on the sex. So it was similar in activity, the manipulation was the same, had the same effect in males and females. It affected more males than females here. It affected males and females in the, in the opposite direction here and here. And here it affected only females and not males. So we see the same principle, that the effects on, of fluoxetine on behavior this time depend on sex and that the interaction between sex and fluoxetine are complex. There is no simple rule. We cannot say that only males are affected or only females are affected or that male it's beneficial for males. There is no simple rule to describe these, uh, these results. So it's the same idea. Complex interactions determine brain pathology. So we can summarize this part of the discussion on the relation between brain and sex by the following. I have shown you that the effects of sex on brain structure depend on environment and genes. This means that there is no matching between the form or the sex of different brain features. And therefore, there are no male brains and no female brains. But the same fact, the same scientific finding itself, also leads to sex differences in pathology. Because what I did here, I just changed, because it's an interaction, so you can play which, well, what you put well. Okay? So I just rewrote it. And we can say that the effect of environment and genes, and this is what determines psychopathology or brain pathology, depend on sex. And this is why we can expect sex differences in pathology. In pathology. And of course, I leave out all the gender differences that, that cause uh, brain differences in brain pathology. I'm only talking uh, wh of what we can learn even from rats. OK. So we move to gender. There are sex differences in behavior, cognition, personality, interests, attitudes, occupation. Of course, these differences are much smaller and fewer than what people tend to think. And also, I am not interested at this point with the source of these differences. Not because this is not important, this is very important, because it's irrelevant to the argument I want to make. Because my question is, do these sex differences add up to create a man and a woman. Or in other words, we know that 99% of humans are males or females and 1% are intersex. And the question is, what is the proportion of men and women and how many of us have intersex gender? Now the existence of, males, of men and women requires that the answer to the questions are sex differences dimorphic and matching will be yes or at least mostly yes. And I think you already know that the answer to both questions is a big no. So I'll go through this more quickly. So we start again with dimorphism. And Janet Hyde and others have convincingly argued that sex differences are not dimorphic. For the most part, where they exist at all, they are 
of the size shown here on, on the left, so there is a very high degree of overlap between the two sexes. Uh, there are also some differences with the larger sex difference, as is shown here. So mental rotation, for example, notoriously known mental rotation, will put us some, somewhere here. And uh, is even rarer examples of a sex difference that, has, uh, that is that large and uh, um, sex differences in attitudes toward, toward casual sex, for example, is an example to a sex difference this big. Again, a lot of uh, a high degree of overlap. And we have recently studied uh, the domain in which males and females vary the most, gender identity. That is how much people perceive themselves as a man and as a woman. And we constructed a questionnaire uh, that uh, included questions such as, uh, in the past 12 months, have you thought of yourself as a woman? In the past 12 months, have you thought of yourself as a man? And the important thing is that everyone had to answer all the questions. So people rated themselves both as their perception of themselves as a man and as a woman. We didn't have other gender possibilities in the questionnaire. And we divided our subject into three gender groups. Uh, one gender group was women, that included people who self-identified as female and woman. Uh, the second gender group was men, people that self-identified as male and men. And the third one was queers, people that self-identify in all other non-normative uh, uh, ways. And I will focus here on the normative groups, men and women. And on the y-axis, we will see how much people perceive themselves as a man, and on the x-axis, how much they perceive themselves as a woman. And uh, the result, it's men blue, uh, women uh, pink, and uh, uh, queers uh, green. And the size of the circle is proportional to the percent of subjects from the same gender group that had the same score. Uh, and if you're really interested in the uh, means and standard uh, deviations, you can see them along the x and y axis. So the obvious uh, observation or finding is that men perceive themselves more as a man than women do, and women perceive themselves more as a woman than men do. This is obvious. But the surprising findings was, or two findings, the first was that over 40% of normatively identifying People, okay, not people that identified as queers, you can see queers, but over 40% of people that self identify in normative ways, as a man or as a woman, uh, perceive themselves to some extent also as the other gender. And even more surprisingly, there was overlap between the distributions. So some men perceive themselves more as a woman than some women did, and some women perceive themselves more as a man than some men did. So we see that even in this domain, with a huge size difference, the size difference is between 4.7 to 5. So it's a huge sex difference. It doesn't equal any other sex difference. We still see an overlap between the distributions of males and females. Um, we are now running an English version of uh, this questionnaire, which we aim to, uh, to get more, a higher number of participants. And of course, I will be happy if you will help us distribute uh, the link to this uh, questionnaire so we can get a lot of uh, subjects in this. So, we can safely conclude that when it comes to gender, there is not even a single sex difference that is dimorphic. Are gender differences matching? I will relate here to the history of a uh, thought of masculinity and femininity, and I'll do this quickly. This field started with the implicit assumption of matching, uh, that is, gender differences or sex differences uh, were, uh, were added up to create a masculinity femininity scale, and masculinity and femininity were sort of as the two poles of this continuum. And we can clearly see the similarity between this view and the current view of the brains as uh, arranged on a continuum between a male brain and a female brain. This view uh, was replaced in the 70s by the work of both Janet Spence and Sandra Bem separately. Each of them discovered that a scale of masculinity and a scale of femininity were not correlated 
and concluded that masculinity and femininity represent two independent factor, factors mm. rather than being on a two poles of a continuum. And the ideas quickly caught up and all of us uh, are aware that we have a feminine side and a masculine side. So this is the, thanks to them. And it is interesting to note that uh, the development of thought of the relation between sex and brain has a similar stage. Margaret McCarthy, again, I'm sorry, uh, has been claiming for several years now that the view that the sexual differentiation of the brain is under the sole influence of testosterone should be replaced with the view that masculinization and feminization of the brain are two independent processes proceeding under the influence of <coughs> testosterone and estradiol respectively. So it's the same view, but this time in relation between sex and the brain. Back to gender. About 20 years later, Janet Spence discovered that the different subscales that create masculinity and femininity are also not correlated. Actually, she rediscovered this. This was already known at the first half of the 20th century. So she concluded that each person possesses a unique mosaic of both masculine and feminine traits and that this mosaic cannot be captured using a unidimensional model of gender, that is masculinity, femininity, or a bidimensional model of gender, masculinity high-low, femininity high-low. So we see a parallel, so we see a parallel in the progression of thought uh, in the domains of gender and brain from a unidimensional models through bidimensional models to multidimensional or mosaic models. But I would like to stress that we should not think of the gender mosaic as a direct result or consequence of the brain mosaic for at least two reasons. First, the relation between gender and brain are bidirectional and not unidirectional. And second is that because the relation between structure and function in the brain are very complex and are not straightforward. But what we can take from this view of gender as a mosaic is that any model of the brain that leads to the prediction that humans can be aligned on a masculinity femininity scale or be aligned on a, some bidimensional model must be wrong because we know for over 40 or 20 years that this cannot be done. We cannot align humans this way. So just to officially close the, the discussion of gender, other men and women know because sex differences in gender are not matching and are not dimorphic. Humans have intersex gender. And I want to summarize uh, with the following. We started the, this discussion with the claim that using 3G sex as a model to understand sex differences in other domains, such as brain and gender, leads to the erroneous assumption that sex differences in these other domains obey the same rules. That is, that they are highly dimorphic and highly matching. And that therefore, humans can be uh, divided into men and women, and brains can be divided into male brains and female brains. And what we have seen today is that parallel line of research have led to the conclusion that although there are sex differences in brain, behavior, cognition, etc., these sex differences are for the most part not dimorphic and not matching. Therefore, they do not add up to create a male brain and a female brain or to create a man and a woman. Rather, humans possess an intersex uh, rather, humans possess an array of gender characteristics and brains are composed of a mosaic of male and fe female <coughs> characteristics. So we see that although 99% of humans are indeed males or females, that is, have all the characteristics of their category, the division of individuals into men and women and of brains into male brains and female brains adds little information beyond the 3G sex. Of the, of the individual. These divisions should therefore be cancelled. I hope I already made clear that I think we should stop using the terms male form and female form and male brain and female brain because these terms are meaningless. I 
I, I would like now to add to this strong recommendation that we, also, we should also stop using the terms men and women. Because these terms create the illusion that there are men and women out there just as there are, and there are males and females out there. And I want to end this talk with uh, a few words about this vision, about a world with no gender but with sex. And in, in this future I envision, there will be male, female and intersex individuals. But, but there won't be men and women. 3G sex will simply be one more correct, uh, term to describe some physiological characteristics, such as height, such as age, such as the color of our skin and of our eyes, but it will not have other uh, meaning. And I think the best example to start to think about this future, which is really very difficult to imagine, is to think about handedness. Not so long ago, left-handed people were sort of as less capable, both mentally and physically. When parents and teachers discovered that someone was using her right hand, uh, left hand, they used to tie that hand to make her use her right hand. And our language still carries traces of that time in phrases such as, I, left up, I, I woke up on my left uh, side, I have two left hands. But uh, nowadays, Although there are still left-handed and right-handed people, and I think this is also a very good example because just as sex, right-handed and left-handed are not a, a dichotomy. There are people in between. I, for example, I am right-handed in my hands but left in, in the legs, so people can be mixed. But there are still right-handed and left-handed people. Uh, but handedness, handedness carries no meaning beyond the description of some physiological characteristic. This physiological characteristic is important in some situations. For example, if you want to buy scissors, you need to buy the scissors for the right hand that you're using. Or if I'm going to play tennis, then it's maybe wise to know whether my opponent is left-handed or right-handed. But I don't care for even one second if my physician is left-handed or right-handed, or if my son's teacher is left-handed or right-handed. I never asked my kids whether they played in the playground with left-handed or right-handed kids. And you will not be telling your friend that the lecture you were hearing today was given by a left, right-handed person. This is what I mean when I say that handedness carries no further meaning beyond describing a fact about one's physiology. And this is what I mean when I say that the future I envision has sex but does not have gender. Gender is a system that attributes meaning to sex. Our gender is not a reflection of our sex. What we have seen today is that even in the gender world in which we live, people have intersex gender. Our gender is one of the prisons with which, within which we live. Gender divides the world into things for males and things for females. And if I want things that are not on my side, I am punished by the people around me. This divide is so clear that children that want many things from the other side sometimes believe that they actually have to have the genitalia that typically goes with that size. In the world I envision, there is no gender. Male, female and intersex individuals are free to choose from all the things our world and our society have to offer. Some will choose only dolls. Others will choose only balls. But many will choose both. And this is an explanation. <laughs> Thank you.